everyone to our fifth webinar of the webinar series on agricultural value chains. Um, before we start, I have to inform you again that we are recording this webinar. Um, this record will then later be published on the SNRD website. So by participating here today, you are um, you are agreeing actually um, that this will happen and that the webinar also will be later um, be accessible publicly. Uh, so this webinar today has a focus on um, farmer-based organizations. Why that? Well, as you all know, um, the challenges for smallholder farmers in our partner countries, they are numerous and extremely difficult to master individually for them. To these, uh, so these are uh, the provision of services, variable quality, um, business skills that are lacking, limited storage, just to name some. So they are seeing themselves at a dis as disadvantages um, to, um, due to high transaction costs and also to low bargaining power. So if smallholders actually want to compete successfully along value chains, they not only have to respond to customer demands, but also focus on efficient operations that are cost effective and be able to raise their voice, to lobby for themselves and also take advantage of economies of scale. Therefore, it is very essential uh, for commercializing smallholder farmers to work together and organize themselves in farmer-based organizations. And today we are talking exactly about uh, the promotion of farmer-based organizations, therefore. As always, we have Alphonse Eilikman with us, board member of the International Value Links Association and Value Links Master Trainer as well as Andreas springer Heinzel, Senior Planning Officer at GIZ and the author of the Value Links methodology. And they will answer us questions uh, on what Value Links has to offer with regard to promotion of farmer-based organizations. And then for some practical insights, uh, we have today Bastian Dunke, who is advisor for the program Promotion of Agriculture, ProAgri, uh, from Benin. Yes, yeah, so welcome. And as always, um, at the very beginning, we are very interested, of course, also on, of your ex on your experience to get to know that. And therefore, we um, uh, prepared some statements for you. And uh, for this, I hand over to Alphonse. Thank you very much, Karina. Um, hello, everybody. Also, a warm welcome from my side for our webinar on farmer-based organizations. Um, let me start with two initial statements. Um, recently, I saw an article that was like this. Most development organizations have an automatic focus on the promotion of agricultural cooperatives without assessing carefully whether this may work or not. Means it's kind of an automatic reflex of development organizations to promote cooperatives. It's always politically correct, but is it really successful? Or are there sometimes better alternatives? If all donors promote agricultural co-ops like a general scheme, uh, this could be quite exaggerated. Second statement is that um, last year I was on a project evalu evaluation mission in Cambodia, and we discussed the economic potential of cooperatives in Cambodia, a country where Cambodians even avoid using the term cooperative as it reminds them of the Pol Pot regime when being called to work in a cooperative just meant double work. In this framework, a Spanish colleague made an interesting statement. He said, it took us 30 years to develop well-performing cooperatives in Nicaragua. However, I think there is no other way to ensure that farmers do not lose out against traders. We just have to promote cooperatives. It's the only way uh, that we see to empower farmers in our value chain. Um, it will take time, it's difficult, but it's just necessary and it's definitely a good way. Um, I think these two statements characterize a little bit um, the broad range of arguments about cooperatives. And we would like to bring you in to our webinar here with uh, one question. 
with regard to these two statements. Um, under which conditions is a cooperative strategy successful? What is necessary to be done? And what are the big, biggest risks that you see? Um, we would like to invite you to think about this question and to share your thoughts with the other participants in our webinar by using our chat function. After the introduction, we will summarize and would like to discuss your contributions a little bit. Okay, so far for the question, I hand back to Karina. Yes, thank you, Alphonse. Um, and as always, uh, we will start with answering some questions to get a better idea of what we are talking about today. And this first question is for Andreas. Andreas, how do we define farmer-based organizations? So, yeah, let me start answering your question, Karina. Uh, first of all, hello to everyone. Uh, nice to meet you again. Um, now, the title of our seminar today is farmer-based organizations. And in fact, uh, when we prepared it, we asked ourselves what actually is an FBO, because as we see it in uh, GIZ, as we define it in GIZ, we always talk about farmer-based organizations. But um, as Alphonse already has introduced in the question we, he made at the beginning, we are talking about cooperatives and we are in a value chain context. So in fact, uh, it is not just any uh, farmer-based organization, organization that is founded by farmers or that is made up of farmers that interests us, but those uh, organizations that have an economic function. Um, so we look at FBOs in the sense of farmer business organization, in fact, uh, cooperatives in the sense of taking over an economic a business uh, role. So I would think um, three points that are relevant for us in a value chain context. First, that for those organizations, rural business is their first priority that they would engage in collective business activities. So they give up to operate as individual farmers, come together, do the business collectively. And then of course, form an organization that would, that, that would be producer owned and controlled. These are three criteria uh, to define what we mean by FBO in, in the context of the seminar. Now, it doesn't mean that those uh, business organizations couldn't also look into the social concerns. But that would be a secondary aspect. First, we are interested in, be, in looking at those organizations as being economic or business entities. Um, these three points that, that you see on the slide um, uh, have been taken from an Oxfam uh, publication, which I can also recommend to you, Producer Organizations, a Guide to Developing Collective Rural Enterprises. So this is what we are talking about. Karina. Thank you very much, Andreas. So now you define for us farmer-based organizations, but now what specifically are the advantages um, of farmers organizing themselves in these organizations? Well, you already have, have, have given uh, a few reasons in your introductory statement. Um, so why are cooperatives organizations important? Uh, the main point, of course, is scale. Um, we always look at poverty orientation, at the poverty orientation of our value chain initiatives. We do value chain development to address poverty. I think that's um, the case in almost all our programs. So the question then is, um, what's the scale of operations uh, of the farmers we care for? Uh, and that's exactly the point. Um, in order to participate in markets, to get integrated into markets, they normally would not have uh, a volume that is interesting for buyers. Uh, the quality is, a, is an issue. Uh, processing can't be done if you don't have the capital or you don't have the raw material. A um, number of um, problems that are connected to scale. And um, as we all know, this has been an issue for the past 200 years almost because cooperatives in Germany started exactly for that reason to overcome the scale problems and establish business models that would work if you work together, if you come together and collaborate. So the issue is economies of scale, reach economies of scale and lower your cost. Uh, these are the four, first four points you see here in production, in processing, in marketing. Um, 
get better prices for the inputs you buy and then also have a better negotiation position to our buyers um, and an another um, set of elements that have to do of course with with scale uh, and then we are talking about the business model um, so when farmers come together forming an association they can specialize uh, in particular business activities um, that they can't uh, do when they're on their own um, and they can also specialize amongst themselves it means if you are in a co cooperative then different farmers who are uh, partners in that uh, cooperative can take also different functions um, yeah the other ones uh, i think have already been mentioned especially countervailing market power is an essential point and then of course uh, as we are in a poverty context uh, let's not forget that there are also social and cultural aspects of coming together um, but we also know that this is sometimes um, connected to some political uh, criteria that may speak against uh, using the cooperative format i think alphonse mentioned uh, that uh, we had a number of countries where the term cooperative doesn't have uh, such a good name Anyway, I mean, here are some of the advantages uh, that I can just uh, name. Back to you. Yeah, thank you for this, Andreas. Um, and now, how do you see actually the role of uh, farmer-based organizations along value chains? Could you give us a bit more insight on that? Yeah, if you switch uh, on the next slide, um, of course, we are in the value chain context. Um, and uh, as Alphonse has mentioned in the beginning, we see um, cooperative solutions as solutions for value chain development. So uh, I would like to start by uh, again having a look at our famous value chain map and uh, show with the help of a value chain map um, where we find those um, cooperatives or organizations. And what you see here is on the left side a very, very simple scheme of a food value chain with just three types of operators, farmers being in the middle position uh, being supplied by input providers and then selling on to buying enterprises that uh, then connect them to markets. Um, I think what we find very frequently, almost everywhere, is that in fact these are not farmers, individual farmer, farmers in, in the position uh, mentioned in the value chain map, but already farmer groups. Uh, because in many villages uh, what happens is that farmers at the village level come together cooperating on buying and selling operations. Um, so this is the reason why I've put here farmer groups in the middle. And what is interesting in this scheme is that you have a double arrow connecting them to the buying enterprise. So in fact what we find is that especially if there are bigger companies that particularly look for raw material, they will uh, engage in organizing farmers to come together and supply them. So uh, the incentive for coming together in a group um, very much comes from the buying end. Um, that is the, I would think, um, starting situation where you can talk of some cooperation and where in fact a collective uh, business emerges uh, as farmers and micro enterprises do no longer operate independently, but rather in a village level pre cooperative. Um, now, this is in, informal. Uh, we always start informal. And if you are in an informal pre cooperative setting, then it means um, yes, you can um, uh, work together, but you also have a problem um, that of informality is such. Um, if you want to move on from an informal cooperation to a formal one, um, the situation looks completely different because then we uh, have the cooperative, a formal cooperative uh, that has members and the business operations are then taken over by a cooperative enterprise that is professionally managed um, by a hired manager. Uh, and the members are represented through a board that controls and supervises management. That is a different system, and it means the difference between formal farmer groups at village level and then coming together even beyond the village and forming uh, those formal cooperatives. Um, I should say that this is a very, very big move. 
Um, we very often have seen in the development of value chains that starting with informal co collaboration is one thing, but then getting to um, cooperative enterprises is uh, just another level um, because it takes not only the legal side of formalization, uh, but it needs capital. Um, and um, in order to found that enterprise, you need most probably also um, a credit and external funding. But um, if, uh, if that is achieved, so if we have formal cooperatives and cooperative enterprises in the value chain, then we are in a much better position. Um, of course, uh, there are also negative experiences. Um, corruption is one. Uh, to the extent that those cooperatives um, yeah, start having success and members don't control uh, sufficiently, you may get into a situation where that management uh, benefits personally. We have had uh, a number of cases where that has happened in the past. Third level of cooperative development and still in, in our value chain context is, of course, uh, that cooperative, formal cooperative, um, also taking on political functions. Um, in value chain development, we talk about coming together between different operators um, in institutions such as a federation of cooperatives or representation at political level, stakeholder roundtables. Um, cooperatives have that possibility to speak for on behalf of their members, organizing the farming community and um, representing farming interests um, at the value chain level. It presupposes that they are organized and they will be invited and heard more if, uh, if they can um, build on a, on a formal structure. So that is a third level. And um, I think uh, that shows how uh, cooperative development fits into a value chain context. Thanks a lot, Andreas. And uh, while we're talking about cooperatives, maybe we stay there and talk a bit more about the conditions for the creation for successful cooperate, uh, cooperatives. Alphonse, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I already saw that in the chat function, you uh, also added or um, indicated some important conditions for the promotion of, for the success of cooperatives that go even beyond the points that we have here. But uh, the points that we have here and in our value links training material we would start with um, the basic principle. There should be a net benefit from cooperating. There should be a clear, easy to understand, simple advantage. What do people get out of the cooperation? And I think if we keep this in mind as a basic principle, and uh, there should be a net benefit from cooperating, this is already quite good. Andreas already pointed out to the advantages of economies of scale that we are aiming at when we are promoting cooperatives. So a condition for the success of cooperatives is that these economies of scale should be feasible, that it should be possible for the pharma groups to achieve them. Um, farmers should also see the benefits, feel the benefits and see the success in a relatively short period of time. The best um, condition is if there is a clear requirement from the buyer side. Um, I have in mind that once I was in Cote d'Ivoire in the cocoa value chain and the cocoa buyer from Cargill told us that he is just requiring that farmers are getting organized and he's not buying from individual farmers. He wants to buy from cooperative. He wants to use the cooperatives as a possibility to channel information and inputs. And uh, if this clear indication from the market side is there, I think it's a very good incentive and a very good basis for being successful as a cooperative. Coherence with existing social structures and traditions. Well, I would say, as I already talked about Cambodia, it's, um, I think the concept is working better in some societies than in others, particularly in post-Soviet um, countries, um, I find it sometimes difficult to um, promote the concept as farmers just don't like it anymore to, to work together. Last point here, members should have common interests, similar resources and needs. And uh, I think 
in the chat function, Andrea Joost already commented on this also earlier and pointed out to the importance of common interests. I think it's very difficult to promote a cooperative if you have two, three very large scale commercial farmers that dominate the cooperative and on the other side, maybe 100 uh, smallholder farmers, both groups will not have much to do with each other. We still have some questions on the slide, um, some critical questions. And um, so questions that we should ask ourselves when promoting cooperatives are, do the functions of the FBO meet the real needs of farmers? Do the needs arise from the farmers themselves? Or is it something that is more donor driven? It should really be uh, the starting point that farmers need a solution to some problems that they have. Uh, we should check whether the FBO represents the interests of all members. Um, is the FBO the simple solution to respond, respond to needs or are there better alternatives? Um, are the needs strong enough to support sufficient commitment? And also is the organization itself, is it easy to understand and easy to manage? Thank you very much, Alfons, for this. And now, um, well, I have another question, actually. What are the criteria to assess the viability of a cooperative? Yeah. As you can see here, we have three different kinds of criteria to assess, to assess the viability of a cooperative, business financial criteria, functional business operations, and governance. Let me zoom in on the first one, um, business model. In fact, this is linked to our new module five of value links to zero. Um, and it's important to see the business model of the cooperative. Is it working well? Is it viable? Um, can it be profitable? What are the linkages to the different um, partners in the value chain? Um, so this is something where uh, we have to assess it carefully and where our other tools like the business model canvas are quite helpful to assess this part. Um, I would also like to comment briefly on the last point, governance, uh, governance bodies, whether they are functional, whether regular meetings are held. I think very often we need to be careful before starting to promote a cooperative or certain cooperatives whether um, they only exist on paper or whether they are really alive and whether farmers represent their interests, whether the different board members are active um, and whether the statutes are applied correctly. Uh, so this is something where in between paper and the real world, there's often a big difference. Thank you very much, Alphonse. And I have one last question for you. How can we as GIZ support farmer-based organizations? Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is also a table from Value Links to Zero from the new manual. And how can we support formal farmer-based organizations? We have uh, three pillars. One is the support of market orientation. Um, ensure that um, the farmer-based organizations have more knowledge about market opportunities, get market information. We can link them actively to buyers um, and we can also help them to fulfill the requirements of the market to be able to take up on these market opportunities. Number two is we can support uh, the improvement of their technical and business performance by professional training training on managerial skills. We can link them to better service providers and financial services. I think uh, Bastian Domke will later on present a very good example of Benin, how the project linked cooperatives, particularly to financial service providers, and how this improved uh, the service provision of the farmer-based organizations. Um, and also the assistance uh, to develop input procurement to provide better services to the members and particularly also for value adding activities. Can the cooperative play a stronger role in uh, processing of agricultural commodities and ensuring market access for the farmers? The third pillar is uh, the organizational development part. 
things that need to be done to formalize the cooperatives, um, help them to improve their organization. Things that are sometimes also required by our political partners. Um, there are some countries in West Africa where uh, the governments um, don't want to work anymore with informal pharma groups, but require the formalization of cooperatives. Um, I would still like to conclude with a remark. Um, and uh, you see it here on the PowerPoint slide. Cooperatives should not be promoted in an isolated way. They should be embedded in, in a decentralized cooperative multi-layer control regulation and support structure. And I think this is highly important. Uh, with the Value Links Association a few years ago, we um, had an excursion in Germany where we visited German cooperatives. And uh, it was very interesting to see um, how well um, associations of cooperatives in Germany train and supervise regularly their members. And this permanent training and control mechanism of associations or federations of cooperatives um, is the most important point to ensure that the cooperatives are going on at, um, yeah, at a good, uh, well-performing level. And um, this is very different. So we should not see the cooperative as one entity. We should see it as part of an overall association federation. And I think here as well, Bastian Domke with uh, the example from Benin will still uh, talk about it. Um, final comment here, um, also from the excursion and uh, assessment of the German system of cooperatives. I think in Germany, even today, 50% of the commercialization of agricultural commodities is done through cooperatives. So it's, more, it's about 50% of the market that they have. I think this shows the importance of this um, yeah, part. Yeah, thank you very much, Alphonse, also for sharing your experience here with us. And now we would like to uh, go back to the statements that Alphonse presented at the very beginning and the question that we asked, uh, under which condition is a cooperative uh, strategy successful, what is necessary, and also what might be risks. And um, you gave us quite some comments and um, you would like to summarize it a bit and then we still have some time to elaborate more on this. I would like to hand over to Anna. Yes, thank you, Karina. Um, I collected all your remarks. Thank you for, for participating. And uh, I clustered them a bit. So um, I would say we start with the success factors. Um, on a cooperative level, uh, you stated that it's important that cooperatives have a common interest um, and a strong, trustworthy, trustful leadership, um, as well as a strong farmer's commitment. Um, the CEOs and board members need to be skilled and trained and um, have a good business um, skill level. On a, on a more um, framework level, uh, clear institutional settings need to be in place for cooperatives to be successful. Uh, on the risk side, you mentioned um, that there might be a um, lack of trust between the farmers, uh, political abuse, um, and um, NGOs using FBO promotions as business models. It was also mentioned that private firms um, don't want organized farmers as they are easy to be taken by competitors. Then there were some additional remarks. Um, somebody from the audience said that these criteria um, apply for all kinds of FBO as defined by Andreas, um, and it would be preferably not to limit ourselves to cooperatives. In reference to this, um, there was a, a, another remark, cooperatives imply a very high organizational level already. And as a very nice final remark from the audience, there is a book recommendation, um, Eleanor Onstrom, Governing the Commons, which outlines a very nicely success factors as trust, common interest, and institutions. Thank you very much for the comments. And I think um, there are a lot of very good points. Uh, we can see that the conditions for successful uh, pharma-based organizations 
it's even a broader range than uh, the few points that we had on our PowerPoint slides. And I can only agree to these different points. Um, that, that's good. It's uh, a lot of things that we have to consider for being able to do a good job when promoting the organizations. Um, there was one comment that I found particularly tricky when I was thinking a long time about what does it mean. I think there was Jonathan Zibula who said that um, there's a risk of political abuse. Um, and he's talking about that FBO promotion becomes a business model for agencies. So when we talk about the business model of cooperatives, the promotion of cooperatives can also become the business model for development organizations. Um, there, I think, uh, okay, it's a tricky point, but we should be careful that this is not the case. Um, also, I when talking about Katharina Schlemper said that um, FBOs or the business model canvas comes from the SP, the sector program. In fact, I was not referring to the SP, I was referring to value links. I think we both have it in our uh, material. That, uh, and it's good to see that the business model canvas is already widely used. Um, I also find interesting from um, Christoph Gusens talking about Cambodia that some farm or some companies don't want that we promote um, cooperatives as they see it as some kind of competition or meaning that uh, other firms can take these cooperatives and uh, maybe it's easier to control independent farmers and if they are organized then it's easier for competitors to take over. Can be. Um, in the cases that I've seen, I think mostly the companies, the processors, traders prefer to buy in bulk, but I see the point. That's so far from my side. Um, I can imagine that Andreas would also like to um, bring a comment. Yeah, maybe just one uh, thing from, from my side. Uh, in fact, this talk about cooperatives uh, refers to the formal kind of uh, enterprise, collective enterprise or cooperative enterprise, which is, as I try to explain, a second level in uh, the evolution of uh, collective business action, if I may say so. Um, so much of what we say about business models um, refers to business, uh, business cooperatives or cooperative enterprises uh, that first have to be founded. When, when it is a farmer group at a village level that is linked to uh, buyers. For example, in the contract farming scheme, I would like to hear what Margaret is saying uh, to that. We are not speaking about cooperatives normally. Uh, this is a form of social and, um, yeah, uh, of course, business oriented organization at the village level, but not a cooperative in the narrow sense. Uh, I think we should keep that uh, distinction uh, clear. Now, I'd like to invite um, uh, Bastian from Benin to uh, share with us their experiences. Bastian, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Karina. Thank you very much, Andreas and Alphonse, for your introductory words. Um, thank you much for giving us this opportunity to present some of our experiences with regards to farmer based organizations in value chains and how to strengthen them in Benin. Now, um, we heard a few general remarks in your introductory words, and I am looking forward to share some of more practical examples from our work here, um, which I do find quite a few similarities. Um, let me just click through the presentation for you guys. Um, uh, thank you very much. By the, by the way, my name is Bastian Domke, and I work for the program Strengthening of Agricultural Economy uh, in Benin, based in Cotonou. All right, a very brief introduction into ProAgri, uh, the program. Uh, our objective is to improve the performance of selected agricultural value chains within four priority uh, product or value chains, cashew, shea, rice, and soy. Um, the guiding principle of our with regards to farmer-based organizations is to support active members, producers and processors. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe just to give you a bit of an idea of what we're looking at here in Benin, uh, farmer business organizations here have to deal with relatively low membership numbers. Um, still, the important, uh, in any way, to get back to the program, um, for us, we saw very the utmost importance to develop capacities 
of pharma business organizations. This is clearly uh, reflected in our interventions planning and monitoring system. We have to give an example two indicators that look at pharma organizations. Um, one aims to increase pharma organizations or pharma based organizations equity. The other one to increase the membership numbers. This is just an outline of our main activities um, that are linked to pharma business organizations. On a, this is classical multi-level approach GIZ work. On the macro level, we advise the agricultural ministry on institutional reforms and product chain or value chain development strategies, training tools and methods for the development of said value chains. Um, on a MISO level, we organize trainings that are aimed at the organizational development of pharma business organizations on the auto organization of value chain actors. We look at how to advise or we try to improve the capacity of value chain actors to develop targeted services for their membership. We also try to get uh, public and private actors to dialogue together efficiently uh, in platforms that we organize with uh, umbrella organizations, agricultural umbrella organizations on local, regional and national level. Lastly, on the micro level, um, we offer training uh, technical trainings, etc., business orientation trainings to mem active members of pharma business or, or pharma-based organizations. Um, yeah, it, it could be on improved production, processing, or commercialization. We are using quite a few of um, GIZ's um, approaches, such as uh, the pharma business school, uh, value links, and contract farming trainings. Um, and we look at facilitating access to inputs, financing, and machinery for pharma-based organization members. Um, we do focus, like I said, on active members. However, it is important that we uh, to note that we provide services for every farmer and processor we can reasonably reach within our intervention regions. <clears throat> All right. Um, let's give you an idea of the legal framework surrounding pharma-based organizations in Benin. The governing body is for the harmonization of business law in Africa. Most people that are familiar with Francophone Western Africa and business and agriculture would know them. They basically provide the legal, uh, the, the binding legal document. Um, this is the Uniform Act on Cooperatives, OSCOP, which has been enforced since 2011. Um, well, you can see the first article of it. It basically states that any kind of union corporation cooperative federation uh, who does business or who acts in, in within one of the member states, which Benin is a member of, that they have to adhere by the rules and bylaws of the Uniform Act. So this is the binding document and we have to uh, obviously promote adhesion to it. Everything that we do uh, within ProAgri is always in line with OHADA and uh, especially with the Uniform Act. Okay, we already saw in the slides from Andreas and Alphonse um, some of the services or some of the things that farmer based organizations can offer their membership. Um, I still want to run through them. This is now the ideal scenario where an organization can supply inputs such as seeds or fertilizer to its members. It can supply tools and machinery. In our case, for example, this would be saws or scissors for cash implantation grooming. Uh, it could be plowing uh, tools. Uh, it could be the shared use of machinery via what in, in German is called a machine kreis, etc. Facilitating financing. Uh, financing products could be one thing. This is done here in Benin together with uh, Profina, which is the global project agricultural finance. Um, and they, they work together to source um, microfinance products from a variety of MFIs. Um, ideally, a pharma-based organization improves the bargaining capacities and positions of its members, um, particularly when it comes to facilitating access of the member's product to, uh, through, uh, to market. This could be done and is done here in Benin, for example, through joint selling or bundle selling schemes, um, contract farming, or we are looking at uh, inventory credit systems, what in French is called, uh, known as Varantage. Um, again, the technical trainings aforementioned, those can be key for the members. Look at, for example, uh, better post-harvest uh, or storage techniques, etc. Um, a farmer-based organization should be able to lobby government uh, for services and inputs. And lastly, the hope is always that um, a farmer-based organization can help its members to generate higher income and profit. 
we've looked at that at country level here in Benin through one of our recent income studies. All right. Um, as ProAgri started its third phase here in Benin and also in the second phase that ran from 2014 to 2017, we did a quite extensive um, analysis of the existing farmer based organizations. And um, we just realized that we needed to focus on providing uh, high quality capacity development for those farm organizations we work with, um, with the goal to create sustainable structures working for the benefit of the rural population of Benin. So still, we realized there are quite a few problems with governance within those organizations in various guises, um, that not enough relevant services were offered to the members, that the dependency level <clears throat> on external funding from donors, etc., uh, was very high. Correspondingly, logically, that um, those organizations had a low capacity to raise funds through the organization itself. So what we identified um, as needs of farmer-based organizations uh, here in Benin to function successfully and to be relevant to the membership is to be representative, so to increase participation of members in activities, also revenue generating activities, uh, to be financially stable, to increase set internal revenue, mostly through membership fees um, and other various contributions, dues, etc. Um, the supporting the intensification of entrepreneurial spirit uh, or the development of, of yeah, business minded actions. Uh, fostering an environment favorable to the creation um, or, and especially to the formalizing of farmer based organizations through common actions and successes. And we saw that earlier uh, as one comment in the, uh, the chat function. Um, it is all about getting on the same page, having a common goal um, that is achieved through common actions. And the common goal should always be here to improve livelihoods of members through common actions. So the services to members are of a paramount importance. This is now a look at uh, the umbrella uh, organizations and the farmer based organizations that are supported by Pro Agri um, in the sheer cashew, rice and soy value chain. I'll just jump over this and give you an example um, for the cash value chain on the next slide that you can see here. I hope you are able to read at least the main titles. Uh, this is now a hierarchical breakdown of farmer based organizations. Um, here, particularly, it's cashew producer organizations as different from, say, for example, cashew processors or cashew merchants. You see that on the national level, we have a national umbrella organization. FENAPAP, we have two regional unions within our intervention region. Um, those are the regional unions of Borgo Alibori and Zukulin. Under each of those uh, regional unions, we have four communal unions. And under each one of each of those eight communal unions, we have village cooperatives of cash and producers. Now, in each communal union, we have anywhere between 16 and 30 uh, village cooperatives. And the membership of those village cooperatives <clears throat> ranges from five to almost 140 members. So you see it's quite a diverse range of um, organizations that uh, are active within our intervention zones and that we have to target capacity development and other services for. Now, how, what did we want to do and what are we doing? We are looking at our work with producers and processes in this next slide. Um, now, after participatory planning, um, we are supporting, uh, this is, a, uh, say, a round of participatory planning. We support farmer-based organizations uh, from the bottom up with uh, the highest quality interventions that we, yeah, that we can do. Um, this is a range of, um, of activities. I'll just give you a rundown of it. Um, Firstly, it's all about a participatory diagnostic of uh, farmer-based organizations. So what works, what doesn't work, what do you actually think about them? Um, then it's about strengthening organizational development. It's uh, well, the capacity development is a very, is a very generic theme. Um, different trainings, mostly it's trainings that are um, adjusted according to identified and expressed needs of the members and the organizations themselves. The formalization of uh, organizations is very important, um, as is the correct application of the Uniform Act principles of OHADA at all levels, all the way down to village cooperatives. You will see that a bit later on. 
um, income generation as a so basically can the farmer based organization make the step from being merely a maybe interest group to actually being a, a commercializing entity and um, and provide uh, an advantage to its members through commercialization of the product is looked at and I mentioned public private dialogue so basically dialogue between government structures and uh, farmer based organizations to get on the same page and discuss issues. Okay, as one of this very, uh, as you can see, vast range of things that we do, um, we developed training modules. Um, now, as you can see, as I think I've shown you, um, there were some needs that were identified and some training needs specifically. So we developed a strategy, an all-encompassing strategy to accompany and help grassroots organizations, um, uh, say the village cooperatives at the base um, of all the value chain groups of all the umbrella organizations. Um, we also, so it's 24 training modules that were developed. I will introduce them to you over the next two, three slides. Um, we also looked at some additional tools and templates, some spreadsheets for basic management tasks administrative, um, financial and accounting management. <clears throat> and we also um, did guidelines, so to speak, for the drafting of 18 basic documents, uh, mostly legal documents such, such as statutes or bylaws. Um, I will also go into a bit more detail a few slides down the way um, for how we trained um, trainers and eventually master trainers and how we aimed to make the, the, this trainer pool the most sustainable possible. All right, let me jump with the next slide right into those 24 training modules. Um, again, I hope you can at least read the outline. Um, the first block is basic trainings where we look at organizational diagnostics, the uniform act, at what is a group and what is a cooperative. The second group, uh, block is more advanced training, so how to actually form a cooperative, how to prepare and run a meeting, uh, financial management of a cooperative, goals and objectives, core values and principles of a cooperative. In the third block, we would look at management training, so how to manage your cooperative, how to control and effectively check uh, checks and balances for the management of a cooperative. Then if it comes to the commercialization part of it, ideally then how to manage your supply, how to manage your stock, how to commercialize your product, how to manage a transformation unit in the case of processes, and uh, how to calculate costs. All right, uh, the fourth block is still a specific training. Um, this is now how to foster leadership within cooperatives because strong, uh, well-educated and confident leaders are very important to be able to yeah, do justice to their membership, but also to uh, whoever else they have to deal with on the outside of the cooperative or of the farmer-based organization. And the last one is how to draft statutes of a cooperative. Now, those 18 modules, they could be aimed at any, um, any kind of uh, farmer-based organizations. The last two blocks, block five and six, look at umbrella organizations like uh, I mentioned the FINA Park Cash example. Now, the first one is um, along the lines of the other modules, but now aimed at umbrella organizations, so how to diagnose. Um, so the diagnosis of cooperative, what is the union of cooperatives, uh, values and principles. Um, and the last block, follow up and coaching, um, how to actually set up a union of cooperatives or umbrella organizations, how to draft the statutes and the planning, monitoring and elevation of the actions. All right, this was a bit of a mouthful, but those are the 24 training modules. Uh, this is a screenshot of what the modules themselves look like. This is now training materials um, that is available for the trainers that we developed. Those documents include um, preparation. So how do you prepare the room? What kind of facilitation material logistics do you need? The main topics to cover for the respective module. Um, some hints and some, also some, some common pitfalls that we encountered while training and some language pointers. Um, now, this is mostly if we speak about the Uniform Act, it could be legal speak that's translated or at least explained into local language. Um, another look at the management tools, I will not go into detail here, but uh, we would say, for example, have uh, certain things like a template for member registry, but it could go quite intricate all the way to, say, for example, a sales registry template or actually a cost benefit analysis tool that we also develop to see, uh, to evaluate the actions of certain activities. 
of certain properties in our follow visualizations. All right, we are now looking at slide number 26, I think this is. Um, it's now the trainers. Uh, obviously, we need good trainers. Those documents by themselves do not achieve any good. Uh, we need strong trainers for this. Um, now, we had quite strict requirements for the first batch of trainers and for the following as well. They needed to have at least a Bachelor of Science equivalent, uh, a high level of proficiency in facilitation. They must be able to work very well with women's and, and men's groups, uh, obviously speak the relevant local languages fluently. And we, uh, for, especially for the first batch, we much preferred consultants, independent consultants that had worked with German Development Corporation previously and have had passed an assessment that we did for them. All right, now the first wave or the first group of trainers, uh, they then rolled out th those first trainings. It became uh, clear very quickly, as you have also seen by the sheer number of um, village-based organizations and farmer-based organizations we deal with, that six trainers would not be able to do all the trainings required. So we uh, decided on the second wave. The first wave assisted, first wave of trainers assisted in training the second wave. So they effectively also were on their way to become trainer of trainers, which they are today. Uh, this is now a second wave of 14 trainers. In the third wave, we were more concerned or we were more aiming at creating a sustainable um, pool of uh, trainers. So we wanted employees of the farmer based organizations and specifically the umbrella organizations as trainers. So we trained uh, technicians from the within the cashew, soy and rice value chain. Now those three waves have been trained over the last four years. Um, this is ongoing. Currently, uh, this week, next week, they are getting some of the tra trainers are getting a refresher course on some of the uh, modules. Okay, for rolling out the um, the trainings, we also um, had to have clear cut roles and responsibilities between the program, um, so Proagri and the umbrella organizations. Um, yeah, basically just the tasks bit clarified, you can see that here. I won't go into detail. All right, now, more importantly, who has actually been trained? Um, what kind of target group organizations have we trained? Um, I will start with uh, Cashew on the left, on the top left, where we uh, trained uh, 120 of the aforementioned village cooperatives. They have followed the entire series of trainings and they went all the way to uh, formally register their cooperatives. They are compliant with OHADA stipulations and the Uniform Act. Additionally, eight of the communal trainings have been trained on institutional and formal aspects. We didn't go any higher here, any higher within the hierarchy of our partner organizations. Um, because the cashew uh, value chain actors are pretty much the most organized within those four value chains. All right, uh, going over to Shia, uh, we trained 20 women groups of Shia nut processors, um, all women, most illiterate, um, living in quite remote villages. They got uh, the 18 basic modules and we developed an additional six modules on how to form a proper legally binding cooperative. So they are also now uh, registered um, legally according to OHADA stipulations and the Uniform Act. We also trained and registered four communal unions, and we also um, developed um, almost 100 village credit and saving associations, AVEX, that combine some of the roles of a farmer-based organizations with uh, what is called as a, what's known as a tontine in, uh, in, in the Frankfurt Western Africa context, so like a savings group. They also give credits amongst their membership. Okay, for soy, we trained uh, 40 village groups of soy cheese. This is tofu uh, producer, uh, processors and seven communal unions. For rice, we trained 41 village groups of rice parboilers, um, six communal unions and three uh, regional slash national umbrella organizations. Now, of these people that we trained and that we worked with and whose capacity at least we worked towards developing or uh, improving, um, we got some results and uh, eventually, hopefully, some impact of the support to farmer-based organizations. Um, overall, I think we, it's fair to say that we got positive feedback from our target group. Um, I'll start with Cashew. Um, the organization level is seen as a lot higher 
um, markedly the shift towards facilitation of commercialization of product for members through the farmer-based organization has been highlighted as something very positive. Um, I spoke to you earlier about the importance of mobilizing financial resources from within the organization for sustainability. So the membership fees, etc., cetera, um, they have been paid more diligently with a higher percentage of fee paying members. Um, uh, in the last installment of this webinar, you would have, uh, if you have followed it, uh, we also had an example from Benin, from my colleagues from Profina, Fabian Segovitz presented uh, a cashew nursery. Uh, what we as ProAgri also do with them, Profina, is to improve access to, to microcredits from MFIs. Um, this is a result of the better bankability, specifically of the farmer-based organizations. So in 2017, we managed to leverage together a 300,000 uh, euro for 36 cooperatives, incorporating almost 800 members, uh, mostly through bundle selling. I get into that, or pool selling. I get into that in a minute. Um, for Shia, um, pretty much the same assessment. Here, I think it's notable to uh, to work that some that the roles and responsibilities of who does what in an organization are much clearer, uh, institutionalized, and the roles and responsibilities are evenly shared. So basic principles uh, are now ingrained within cooperatives, such as the clear distinction between cooperative funds and individual funds. Um, apparently, and I think Andreas also mentioned that cashiers, uh, cashiers so the, whoever's keeping the, the money of the cooperative or the organization, were not always so straight about that, apparently. Okay, um, I'm going forward one slide, continuing with the feedback from the target group. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Let me just go back once. Uh, also, to give you the numbers for the uh, credit for the microfinance product, so it's 72,000 euros for 27 cooperatives, almost 700 members that profited uh, through profited from microfinance products leveraged through the farmer-based organizations. Um, in soy, also, uh, the core membership on the ground is organized more neatly with stronger regional and community unions. Um, again, we leveraged credit, almost 61,000 euros for 16 cooperatives, almost 300 members. For those uh, credit numbers, our, in our operational plan for 2018, we're looking at doubling those numbers. And by the end of the project 2020, we want to quadruple, so by four of them. Um, I think it's also last time Profina didn't get the opportunity to mention, um, so I can do it as well, um, that through their successful negotiation and through our work with the farmer based organization, uh, we have a 100% repayment rate of those credits, something we're very proud of, and we're working very hard to maintain uh, also for this doubling or quadrupling over the next years. Okay, just to tell you a bit more about the pool selling, um, which is now the successful commercialization um, method. Now, this is pool selling means that members of a, of a cooperative sell their stock, for example, of shea nuts to the cooperative. The cooperative pays them with funds that they leveraged from MFI. The merchandise is stocked in the warehouse that is managed by the umbrella organization. And uh, the stock of merchandise serves as collateral against the loan. The money is handled via a third bank account, uh, in this instance, at the Bank of Africa. Um, this is now obviously something that's only feasible if the organization is strong enough to ensure the smooth running, but it has been made possible in three value chains, as I showed you, and the fourth rise is starting now this year, thanks to the increased organizational capacities. Um, I think it's quite important to highlight that such a new sold after service makes uh, farmer based organizations very attractive to the existing members and also to potential new members. So we hope that this helps them to increase their membership numbers. Okay, what is next for farmer business organizations uh, and Huagi? Um, apart from continuing on our path of training uh, farmer based organizations, we are also currently developing a method to look more intensively at coaching farmer based organizations on the training, so the follow up of it. Uh, we want to focus mostly on local clusters, so wherever there is a market. Uh, we assume there's a cluster of different actors, of value, uh, different value chain actors, and we want also to focus on them. <clears throat> uh, 
we want to um, look at live coaching and monitoring to see how the training contents are actually applied. Um, just to give you an idea also, those training modules are available in French. Um, they could reasonably well be translated into English or other languages, and we are more than happy um, to get into contact with you if you have any questions or if you want to have a look at whatever. Please do not hesitate to email me. All right. Um, as one next step also of what uh, we are doing in Benin, um, but not exclusively in Benin, I also want to uh, start introducing to this webinar now the uh, training and coaching module Business Orientation of Pharma Business based organizations, pardon me, um, maybe uh, to give you an idea of how this came about. At the outset, um, it, it became quite clear to us that farm organizations here in Benin weren't very entrepreneurially minded. They simply hadn't seen the necessity for it, or they didn't have the necessary capacity to pursue income generating activities as part of their vast list of duties. So the need for scientifically sound training was voiced and taken up. And this is a joint project of the sector project Agricultural Trade and Value Chains, uh, ProAgri, and many other GZ projects here in Benin, but also in, in a range of other Western African countries. I'm sure there's a few participants here that know more about this than me. The objective uh, is now the strategic orientation for developing sustainable revenue generating pharma organizations through capacity development. Um, for us, we see it as a logical next step for pharma-based organizations that need to increase their revenue and to provide attractive service to members. As such, the target group um, is mostly rather well-organized, mature FBOs that can already focus on revenue-generating activities. Um, it should be about developing sustainable, profitable business models. I can speak um, here now only for the pilot phase in Benin, which will start in June. That's the day after tomorrow, um, to all the way through to October 2018. We will roll out four modules for the cashew producer umbrella organization, FENAPA. Um, let me just click to slide number 34, which is a screenshot of the how the training and coaching module um, is, what the layout is and what the logic behind it is. It's comprised of three or four trainings which are accompanied by a coaching phase for the farm organizations after each round of training. Um, this helps them to transfer lessons learned in class to their actual daily work. Um, as far as I understand, uh, Katharina Schlemper and some other colleagues from the sector project are also there to um, speak a bit more about those, uh, this training and coaching module. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm at the end of my presentation. Um, it was a pleasure to be able to share with you some of our experiences from Benin. I have not had a chance to look at the uh, comments. I will do that now. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Bastian, very much for this really interesting presentation on your approach, the training development, and also showing us already some really nice experience um, and impact that the training had. You already mentioned the module on business orientation for FBOs and in the comments um, I've already read about uh, cooperative business school and as I've seen um, under the participants there are also some colleagues um, who are um, there who could say a bit more about these um, trainings and modules and I would like to start actually with uh, Katharina Schlemper and Margaret Will maybe um, who could give us um, a quick input on the module on business orientation for FBOs before we come to answering all the questions that you posted for Bastian. Also, thank you to Bastian. Um, you gave already some insight on the, on the module. Um, let me talk a little bit more about the, the background and the development of this uh, module. This has been um, is um, has been um, developed in cooperation with um, the ABIVCD working group of SNRD, and um, the sector project has facilitated um, the establishment of a working group um, for business orientation of uh, pharma-based organizations since uh, 2016. And um, participate depends were mainly um, bilateral programs as well as um, green innovation centers from Benin, Burkina Faso, Mali and Tunisia. 
And this is also the reason why um, the first version of this module is um, in French, but we are um, about to finalize the, um, the translation of the module into English, at least for the first uh, sub-module. Sub so there are four, uh, four sub-modules. Um, first of all, or the first one is um, on the development of strategies for profitable um, activities for the FBOs. The second module is on uh, capacity building of FBOs uh, in management. The third one, um, development um, of management capacities in uh, marketing and trading. And the fourth is um, uh, on the question how to include sustainable development um, aspects. I'm also very happy that um, at least two of the colleagues who work closely with us um, on this module are with us today. There's Margaret Will and there's also Yaya Mamagia from Benin who um, have worked as, um, as co-authors of this uh, module. And I think they will um, add something after, um, after my little input. Um, Bastian has already talked about the, the objectives um, and the target groups. So this is um, mainly um, for FBOs, which have already reached a certain level um, and have already abilities to develop um, activities which con uh, contribute to their economic uh, growth. And uh, what we did was uh, we clearly made reference and um, adapted modules, mainly of GIZ, but also of other um, organizations um, that already existed. So as Bastian also said, um, um, the very good modules of ProAgri in Benin, but also, for example, of the Green Innovation Center in Benin, um, with regards especially to the business and um, uh, um, coaching loop, then also from programs in, in Kenya, the former private sector development and agriculture, but also um, FAO and others. And um, we already talked about that, or I think that was in the comments. Uh, we tried to um, see how um, how we could um, complement to the module, which is um, which is developed by SSIB um, AB on the cooperative uh, business schools. Um, we have started um, the training of trainers for the first sub-module in Burkina Faso in April. There are um, currently test trainings run, um, running with uh, selected FBOs in Burkina. And uh, as Bastian mentioned, Benin is going to follow, but also uh, probably Tunisia and Mali. And as I said, uh, the module will be translated into English and then also English speaking countries can follow. So um, I will end here and I would ask uh, Yaya and also Margaret uh, to add if there's any need to, or if there are any other comments on this. Maybe um, Margaret and Yaya can also um, add more during the coming um, conversation and uh, discussion. Um, now, uh, Anne-Marie Mattes is also joining this and uh, they developed the Cooperative Business School and we would be really happy if you could share uh, some information and give us some input on the Cooperative Business School. Then let me just let me just uh, give you some some uh, some short short information. What was the motivation to develop this? Uh, as you know, uh, in our program we developed Pharma Business School and brought it to scale. And what we saw after after this training in all countries except uh, perhaps Cote d'Ivoire, because there we were focusing exclusively on cooperatives, that new cooperatives emerged. And uh, so many groups registered cooperatives uh, that we said, oh, we need sort of a standardized support protocol to help them to do transparent, uh, to develop and provide transparently and uh, conducive business services to their members, to their members uh, that have also an added value. And uh, we started to compare and to assess the different curricula for, for producer organizations across the West Africa. And what we saw was actually that the emphasis was completely or almost completely on uh, institutional issues. 
And uh, well, a producer organization, a cooperative is a business entity. And uh, for that reason, we put the, the, a very strong emphasis on the, on the business services. That means group marketing, group sales, group procurement, bulk procurement of inputs, how to tender input procurement, uh, how to negotiate contracts, uh, sales contracts, but also develop technical services uh, on a commercial basis for the members. Uh, example, given pruning of cocoa trees or nurseries uh, for vegetables, for example, um, uh, and the like, okay? And one of the purposes is of course to enhance transparent business services provided uh, and well prepared, well planned, well communicated with the members and with the external parties uh, to implement such, uh, such services and also to have very clear policies how to constitute working capital and what part of the benefit made through, to, through uh, the, of the economies of scale, which part should be plowed back to the members. Well, so the curriculum has been developed for five, in two languages for five countries. For five countries, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, uh, Togo, uh, Nigeria, and Cameroon. In Cameroon, we have two curricula, in English and in French. And we started implementation rolling out last year. And interestingly, our partners, they are taking over a, a, a very significant share of the cost already be it by mobilizing trainers, by mobilizing venues, or taking up any other type of cost, uh, that uh, the average cost per participant is around 150 to maximum 250 euros, which is not too bad because, well, you cannot compare that with the pharma business school training that is delivered in the communities uh, for the cooperative business school you have to bring the people together. Um, yeah. Okay, maybe a little bit on the first impacts we observe. Um, interestingly, well, there are cooperatives that have completely changed their modes of management and of operation in a very, very short time. So we have first success stories on cooperative business school that uh, indicate that uh, they have up to tripled, for example, uh, group sales of their produce, that they get better prices because they, have, they are unified in negotiation. Uh, other cooperatives have got access to, to financial services to get working capital. So these are quite interesting, interesting uh, successes. Uh, but we, of course, we need to have more, more systematic data collection to consolidate that, to extrapolate. Uh, perhaps the total outreach so far that has implemented for management teams from uh, 250 cooperatives across the different uh, countries, and a total of 1,300 something persons. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie, also from my side. And uh, I find it highly interesting to see um, how much um, good material has been developed by the different projects on uh, the organizational development and the business orientation of the cooperatives. And um, yeah, I think that's uh, uh, something where a lot has been done already or developed in the last few years and that can still be uh, put forward to larger outreach um, and I think that's good, good sources that we have there and um, I think that's also the aim of our webinar to be informed about the different materials that are available uh, and to see how other projects can use them. Thank you very much there also for this contribution. Um, I think uh, for the moment also Bastian there were some questions that addressed you directly in terms of uh, some things people wanted to, uh, to still know. Um, yeah, are there a few points where you feel comfortable to answer some of these points? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Alphonse. Also, thank you very much to everyone who wrote comments in the first place who listened and in the second place who wrote a comment or a question. I, I noted a few, I noted down a few questions now from the chat function where I will happily give you a, a quick answer to the best of my ability. Um, please don't 
also don't hesitate to shoot me an email um, if you want to get into more detail or if you feel that I haven't done your question justice. Um, the question came up about lessons learned. Um, uh, I realized a slide about this would not have been amiss since obviously this is not always maybe as smooth as <laughs> we try to present it. And I think it's very important to look at what has not uh, gone so right. Um, maybe two things that I can um, answer to this. The first thing, um, excuse me, it's quite obvious, but this takes a lot more time than we thought. Uh, it's very nice to have a nice rollout plan for a year or for 18 months, and then you realize it takes longer. So um, whenever trying to plan something like this, um, just make sure to uh, allow for more time. The second very important lesson um, is all about the trust we had uh, in one of the, as, as an answer to uh, one of the initial questions, the issue or the, the subject of trust um, has been brought up. And I'm sure every country is different, every context is different, but uh, mutual trust here in Benin at least is not as high as in other contexts. So uh, really working on that and making 200% sure that you deliver and that the pharma organization delivers what they promise is really of the utmost importance. Um, this is also now, uh, I saw a comment from uh, Jonas Sibula um, that said, uh, he wrote, you have to start with simple transactions and that's something that I also believe. Um, there's no, I, I don't think this would have gone as nicely if we would have started with something too complicated. It's much better to start step by step, module by module, and build upon your successes and upon your experiences. Um, the question also came up, how do you deal with different uh, sizes of uh, pharma-based organizations? Um, the membership numbers, like I uh, pointed out, it, to give you the example, it, it ranged from 5 to 140 members. Um, obviously, you have to adjust accordingly to this. Um, the trainings, um, the logistics of it, how many trainers you need, uh, the financial implications of it. Can you actually hold a training for 140 members? Will they actually come? So I have to say to me, this is, I perceive this as more of a technical problem, uh, a logistical problem than something fundamental. So just adjust accordingly. Um, Andreas, um, you wrote twice, I think, and that's a very important question about the different business models for different uh, hierarchical levels of pharma business organizations or pharma-based organizations. Um, you're quite right, obviously. Um, not every pharma-based organization will uh, do the same income generating activity. <clears throat> what I mentioned here, for example, for the bundle selling or the pool selling, takes place at the village cooperative level, for example, within the cashew value chain or within the Shia value chain. Um, we are still, we, I can't say that we have income generating activities or that our pharma based organizations have income generating activities at every single level. So, uh, for example, within the Shia value chain, we have uh, pool selling on the village cooperative or the, the women group level. Um, and we also have um, an example from the umbrella organization that is negotiating directly with, uh, with a multinational uh, company for the exportation of Shia butter, um, where they then work with some of their communal unions. So it's a bit, we are trying to add more and more revenue generating activities, but again, in the spirit of doing things right slowly from the start, and building trust and to taking it one step of, at a time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bastian. There were uh, a couple of more questions that I noted. Um, um, maybe you can also answer them. Um, there was one question from Veronica Kling. How have you selected the cooperatives or beneficiaries that have received the training? Okay. Um, now, basically, I, I think I, I mentioned at the beginning that we did um, uh, participatory planning. So first off, we are obviously uh, geographically limited within a number of uh, regions here in Benin. So this first off <clears throat> already limits the number of people that we uh, can potentially reach. Then within those regions, um, obviously farmers do quite a few different activities. So uh, we did a kind of assessment of who actually does those kinds of um, activities producing or processing based on that. Um, it's, it varies a little bit from value to value chain, but we kind of have our goals of who we could potentially reach. 
And then we looked at um, what umbrella organization already has, what kind of organization the level. So say, for example, within cash, the organizational level was much higher. Within Shia, it was much lower. So we try to get as many of them already as we can. Um, we still have quite a way to go to add more of those farmer based organizations. Um, <clears throat> we did not. OK, the second thing I also think uh, that has to be clear is why we try to uh, provide services for as many people as we can. Obviously, our budget and our time and whatnot limit us, but also our focus is on active members. So we want to make farmer business organization, farmer based organizations attractive, and we believe in doing in making them attractive or that they can be attractive to their members by providing exceptional and interesting services. And thus, uh, we try to focus our um, our activities on the active members. However, if you look at now, for example, the training that takes place at village level for how to hold an annual, annual general meeting, uh, it's not as if we would want or be able to send away people that are interested in attending such a meeting. May they or may they not be active members. So we have our definition, but we also have to show some flexibility. Thank you. Um, so there's one uh, question from um, Wilms Posen. Um, you focused on the results that ProAgri achieved together with Profina. Um, will this topic be addressed in the new model? Um, Katharina Schlemper just answered it and said yes. So um, the next question and last question for you. How do you ensure that all this uh, will bring effective change in the level of the pro producer organizations, knowing that their participation in the financing is always in insignificant? That was a question from Mama Guayaya. Yes, uh, thank you, Mama. Um, looking forward to seeing you also in the rollout phase here in Benin very soon. Um, well, um, that's, that's, it's a very tough question as a last question, but I think we, there's a few key points that will help us to make sure that we have maximum effect and impact. Um, I think the really the rigid and participatory planning uh, together with those farmer based organizations is already the, the, basically the foundation. Um, our monitoring system uh, is quite diligent when it comes to checking on uh, activity levels, but also on outputs, um, what has actually been done, what has been achieved. Um, other than that, it's a, it becomes kind of like an academical discussion, um, which we're also trying to look into. For example, can you actually distinguish, uh, say, for example, revenue or margins of, um, of processes or producers that are members or not members of uh, farmer based organizations and such. But that becomes a broader discussion, I think. I hope this answers your question. Thank you very much. So as a last question that will go to Alphonse, um, there was the problem mentioned concerning the reluctance of many large businesses that um, don't want to work with um, farmers that are organized in cooperatives. How can this problem be solved? I was, I must say, I was surprised about some comments of Christoph Goosens and I think also Pierre Johnson and also Margaret. That they said, um, yeah, particularly some processors, larger traders, are quite reluctant to work with cooperatives, don't like the idea too much. Uh, I must say, I did not see that so far in our value chain promotion. I saw more the interest from processors and traders to work with well-functioning cooperatives and that uh, these processors and traders stress the need to have well-performing cooperatives um, and other uh, farmer-based organizations to work with them and to supply them. Uh, for me, I take this from this webinar that um, we should be more careful there and that it's not always so clear that there is this interest how can this be addressed? I think Margaret in the chat function um, provided the answer. Um, maybe it becomes better or the interest will be higher if these FBOs become more entrepreneurial and have better business models that are attractive for the other partners in the value chain. But I think these two sides are linked to each other. Um, on one side, they are reluctant, but if the other side becomes more professional with the support that we are providing, then maybe also the reluctance will become less. So I think that's um, an interesting point regarding the value chain promotion.
uh, that's what I would like to say there. Um, I would also like to bring in again Andreas. Uh, maybe Andreas, we are coming to an end with the webinar. Is there still anything that uh, you would like to, to add? Yeah, thank you for calling me in again. Um, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the for for the many comments and uh, interesting examples. Um, I, what I observed during our discussion is that we are talking about pharma-based organizations, and at the same time, we are talking about cooperatives. Uh, so, what are we really uh, referring to? Uh, in my own presentation at the beginning, beginning, I tried to make a difference between an informal, um, uh, yeah, farmers groups group and in fact, a cooperative, which in our understanding would be a registered company with an own bank account, owning capital, being able to do business transactions on its own. Um, I wonder whether we talk about the same thing sometimes, uh, because it would have implications. If you have a, cooper a true cooperative, which is a registered company of its own, has its management, then obviously the management of that cooperative enterprise needs other kinds of in uh, of training and support uh, than say the members because it is a question of how the cooperative enterprise deals with uh, the members of that cooperative that are individual uh, farmers um, being part of that cooperative um, so um, here i think we have to again uh, come back to that distinction i find it important uh, also for our ways of of, tr of giving training because we have within the within that movement we have different functions this was also the reason why I asked um, Bastian for those hierarchical levels. It could be that if you talk about unions, you talk about support service providers, isn't it? At least in our understanding, um, not saying control, but rather support service, uh, the unions would be giving support to uh, the lower levels in that hierarchy. But it can as well be that the union is in fact, uh, like the regional union that you mentioned, is in fact another cooperative that has a business uh, function. That, I think, uh, could be clarified a little better. Where are, what is the, the exact economic function in the value chain? Is it, um, is it a level at which you are providing support to cooperatives or is it cooperatives uh, itself? So um, here are still, I think, a, a few points to, to look into again. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Andreas. I would still like to add one thing here there. And um, maybe, yeah, it's important that we make this difference between farmer based organizations and cooperatives. The cooperatives are the formal kind of uh, farmer, or one formal kind of farmer based organizations only. But nevertheless, from what I see, particularly in Western Africa, um, it's something where um, whether it's our business partners in the value chain or whether it's the governments, there is more and more the, pre you know, the requirement to work, to formalize um, informal farmer groups and to work more with cooperatives and I think also to come up with such um, legislation like the OADA law that reduces the formal requirements for cooperatives to have a not too heavy machine, but still a formal one. And I think this formalization and to work more in the direction of cooperatives and maybe a bit less with informal groups, I think is important for the value chain development. So maybe not always the main thing for reducing poverty, maybe for fighting poverty than informal groups um, are sometimes more important, but for professionalizing um, the organizations for making them more reliable and better business partners. I think in general, as far as I see in the project that I know, um, the cooperatives or to work to formalize them into cooperatives is more and more important. Just that's what I wanted to say there. Yeah, thank you, Alphonse. And um, yeah, as we are running out of time, I think uh, we have to stop here. And uh, yeah, seeing all the comments and uh, questions, I see that um, we could still continue with the discussion. Specifically, I would like to thank Bastian for this really interesting presentation. Also, Katharina Schlemper and Anne Marie Mattes for their inputs. Um, uh, from their trainings and experiences and all of the participants for their questions and comments, of course. 
And uh, yeah, finally, um, if the as soon as the recording is actually online, we uh, would share the link with you so that you can uh, share it as well and have another look at it. So yeah, thanks again for your participation in the lively discussion and hopefully see you next time. Have a nice day and bye.